Welcome. I'm your host, Brad Bates, and this is Dark Classics, a show that reaches into the past to pull out familiar and not-so-familiar short stories and poems from the Gothic and Victorian eras. Classics from authors like Edgar Allan Poe, Bram Stoker, Percy Shelley, Charles Dickens, and more. So sit back, turn the lights down low, get comfortable, and let's open a new chapter to a dark classic. Chapter 2, The Feast of Beauty. The Feast of Beauty approaches rapidly, yet hardly so fast as my royal master wishes. He seems to have no other thought than to have this feast greater and better than any have held before. Five summers ago, his Feast of Beauty was nobler than all held in his sire's reign together. Yet scarcely was it over, and the rewards given to the victors when he conceived the giant project whose success is to be tested when the moon reaches her full. It was boldly chosen and boldly done, chosen and done as boldly as the project of a monarch should be, but still, I cannot think that it will end well. This yearning after completeness must be unsatisfied in the end. This desire that makes a monarch fling his kingly justice to the winds and strive to reach his mecca over a desert of blighted hopes and lost lives. But hush, I must not dare to think ill of my master or his deeds, and besides, walls have ears. I must leave alone these dangerous topics and combine my thoughts within proper bounds. The moon is waxing quickly, and with its fullness comes the Feast of Beauty whose success as a whole rests almost solely on my watchfulness and care. For if the ruler of the feast should fail in his duty, who could fill the void? Let me see what arts are represented and what works compete. All the arts will have trophies, poetry in its various forms, and prose writing, sculpture with carving in various metals and glass and wood and ivory and engraving gems and setting jewels, painting on canvas and glass and wood and stone and metal music, vocal and instrumental, and dancing. If that woman will but sing, we will have a real triumph of music, but she appears sickly too. All our best artists either get ill or die, although we promise them freedom or rewards, or both, if they succeed. Surely never yet was a feast of beauty so fair or so richly dowered as this which the full moon shall behold and hear. But ah, the crowning glory of the feast will be the crystal cup. Never yet have these eyes beheld such a form of beauty, such a wondrous mingling of substance and light. Surely some magic power must have helped to draw such loveliness from a cold block of crystal. I must be careful that no harm happens the vase. Today, when I touched it, it gave forth such a ringing sound that my heart jumped with fear lest it should sustain any injury. Henceforth, till I deliver it up to my master, no hand but my own shall touch it lest any harm should happen to it. Strange story has that cup, born to life in the cell of a captive torn from his artist home beyond the sea to enhance the splendor of a feast by his labor, seen at work by spies, and traced and followed till a chance, cruel chance for him, gave him into the hands of the emissaries of my master. He too, poor moth, fluttered about the flame. The name of freedom spurred him on to exertion till he wore away his life. The beauty of that cup was dearly bought for him. Many a man would forget his captivity whilst he worked at such a piece of loveliness, but he appeared to have some sorrow at his heart, some sorrow so great that it quenched his pride. How he used to rave at first. How he used to rush about his chamber and climb into the embrasure of his window and gaze out away over the sea. Poor captive, perhaps over the seas, someone waited for his coming who was dearer to him than many cups, even many cups as beautiful as this, if such could be on earth. Well, well... We must all die soon or late, and who dies first escapes the more sorrow. Perhaps. Who knows? How, when he had commenced the cup, he used to sing all day long, from the moment the sun shot its first fiery arrow into the retreating hosts of night clouds, till the shades of evening advancing drove the lingering sunbeams into the west, and always the same song. How he used to sing all alone 
Yet sometimes I could almost imagine I heard not one voice from his chamber, but two. No more will it echo again from the wall of a dungeon, or from a hillside in free air. No more will his eyes behold the beauty of his crystal cup. It was well he lived to finish it. Often and often have I trembled to think of his death as I saw him day by day grow weaker as he worked at the unfinished face. Must his eyes never more behold the beauty that was born of his soul? Oh, never more. Oh, death, grim king of terrors, how mighty is thy scepter. All powerful is the wave of thy hand that summons us in turn to thy kingdom away beyond the poles. Would that thou, poor captive, hadst lived to behold thy triumph, for victory will be thine at the feast of beauty, such as man never before achieved. Then thou mightest have heard the shout that hails the victor in the contest, and the plaudits that greet him as he passes out, a free man, through the palace gates. But now thy cup will come to light amid the smiles of beauty and rank and power, whilst thou liest there in thy lonely chamber, cold as the marble of its walls." And after all, the feast will be imperfect, since the victors cannot all be crowned. I must ask my master's direction as to how a blank place of a competitor, should he prove a victor, is to be filled up. So late, I must see him ere the noontide hour of rest be passed. Great spirit, how I trembled as my master answered my question. I found him in his chamber, as usual, in the noontide. He was lying on his couch, disrobed, half-sleeping, and the drowsy zephyr, scented with rich odors from the garden, wafted through the windows at either side by the fans, lulled him to complete repose. The darkened chamber was cool and silent. From the vestibule came the murmuring of many fountains and the pleasant splash of falling waters. Oh, happy, said I in my heart. Oh, happy great king that has such pleasures to enjoy. The breeze from the fan swept over the strings of the Aeolian harps, and a sweet, confused, happy melody arose like the murmuring of children's voices singing afar off in the valleys and floating on the wind. As I entered the chamber softly with muffled footfall and pent in breath, I felt a kind of awe stealing over me. To me, who was born and have dwelt all my life within the precincts of the court, to me, who talk daily with the royal master and take his minutest directions as to the coming feast, to me, who had all my life looked up to my king as to a spirit and had venerated him as more than mortal, came a feeling of almost horror, for my master looked then in his quiet chamber, half sleeping amid the drowsy music of the harps and fountains, more like a common man than a god. As the thought came to me, I shuddered in fright, for it seemed to me that I had been guilty of sacrilege. So much had my veneration for my royal master become a part of my nature that, but to think of him as another man, seemed like the anarchy of my own soul." I came beside the couch and watched him in silence. He seemed to be half listening to the fitful music, and as the melody swelled and died away, his chest rose and fell as he breathed in unison with the sound. After a moment or two, he appeared to become conscious of the presence of someone in the room, although by no motion of his face could I see that he heard any sound, and his eyes were shut. He opened his eyes, and seeing me, asked, "'Was all right about the Feast of Beauty?' For that is the subject ever nearest to his thoughts. I answered that all is well, but that I had come to ask his royal pleasure as to how a vacant place amongst the competitors was to be filled up. He asked, how vacant? And on my telling him, from death, he asked again quickly, was the work finished? When I told him that it was, he lay back again on his couch with a sigh of relief, for he had half arisen in his anxiety as he asked the question. Then he said, after a minute, All the competitors must be present at the feast. All, said I, all, he answered again, alive or dead, for the old custom must be preserved and the victors crowned. He stayed still for a minute more and then said slowly, victors or martyrs. And I could see that the kingly spirit was coming back to him. Again, he went on. This will be my last feast of beauty, and all the captives shall be set free. Too much sorrow has sprung already from my ambition. Too much injustice has soiled the name of king. He said no more, but lay still and closed his eyes. 
I could see by the working of his hands and the heaving of his chest that some violent emotion troubled him, and the thought arose. He is a man, but he is yet a king, and, though a king as he is, still happiness is not for him. Great spirit of justice, thou metest out his pleasures and his woes to man, to king and slave alike. Thou lovest best to whom thou givest peace. Gradually, my master grew more calm, and at length sunk into a gentle slumber. But even in his sleep he breathed in unison with the swelling murmur of the harps. To each is given, said I gently, something in common with the world of actual things. Thy life, O king, is bound by chains of sympathy to the voice of truth, which is music. Tremble, lest in the presence of a master strain thou shouldest feel thy littleness and die. And I softly left the room. Thank you for tuning in to Dark Classics. This has been a Red Oak Media production. All musical scores are written and recorded by Jonathan Hamlet and narration recorded by Brad Bates. You will tune in next time for a new chapter of another dark classic. classic.